started. My name's Jonathan Gray. I'm with the Comcast Content Delivery Network team. I've been on the operations and automation side of the fence now for just over three years. And uh, looking at, uh, you know, been in the industry itself and with a very varied uh, experience, of probably over 10. But today I'm going to go over with you a bit um, about some things we've done not with necessarily within the Apache Traffic Control Project scope, but outside of it as well. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about um, not just some of the open source components um, that we do leverage, but also some of the closed source technology stack choices we've made. Now, because those choices are ours and they're not gonna necessarily be appropriate for all implementations, um, I'm not gonna dive super deep into some of the code that I have today but I'm going to more importantly talk about the concepts and the reasons and the rationales as to why I chose things the way I did. Um, so hopefully you can take away from this something that um, inspires you to kind of think about how self-service for your environments might look um, and uh, being able to relate those things back to your technology choices and your implementations. First off, um, let me start with a with a with a uh, forward that um, kind of in terms of infrastructure, there are more or less two paths forward within the Apache Traffic Control Project. One is our CDN in a box effort, whereas um, today I'll be focusing on our Ansible-based lab deployments instead. Um, it very much is uh, for CD in a box. Everything runs local. Very few dependencies. Um, everything's containerized. Um, very simple to get going quickly. Whereas on the Ansible-based lab deployment side of the fence, um, it's only the pieces that are common to the to bear, between implementations of the project and only the pieces that are in the scope of the project itself. So there's going to be more work necessary to make it useful to you. Um, but the pieces that are there should be generally applicable. For those of you who are joining us um, this year that were not with us last year, um, this is almost an extension of a talk I gave last year. And so if you're interested, um, those links will take you to last year's presentation and slides. You're welcome to review those at your leisure afterward. Um, but I'm gonna go ahead and give you a quick recap for the most necessary pieces of, of being able to kind of understand where we're at. In my brain, kind of the way I break things up in terms of deploying a full bore CDN from nothingness to function functionality is I think of things in terms of three layers, um, a provisioning layer that deals with getting um, a system off the ground from nothingness to more of a vanilla operating system state, and then more of a steady state layer on top of that, dealing with things that make it more general to your own implementations. And then lastly, the application layer, which deals with each of the components of an ATC uh, or Apache traffic control stack. Um, everything from databases to caches to um, metrics, everything. Um, everybody's gonna have their own choices of kind of how they go about that. Um, people are gonna use um, different pieces. Um, that's going to lower their your costs in terms of getting off the ground by using things you're already familiar with. Let me start off a bit about provisioning. Start at the bottom. Um, at Comcast, um, we do a lot of things with physical hosts when it comes to things that are performance sensitive. So things like our traffic routers and uh, caches, for example, we typically deploy onto bare metal hardware and things that are less performance intensive, like traffic ops, for example, will leverage cloud resources um, for rapid deployments or for um, greater redundancy and reliability outside of our own maintenances. If you've ever looked around inside a traffic portal before, if you look under the tools menu, there's this option that's been hiding there that you probably have looked at but not really messed with too much called ISOGEN. If you look at the documentation for Apache traffic control, there's um, sort of a, an embracement of the kickstart methodology for building um, bootable images, which is a Fedora concept um, that extends all the way through RHEL 
and CentOS, um, which also matches up with our standard RPM packaging formats for all the binaries. If you use the ISOGEN form and have um, the appropriate config files in place and have um, the kickstart um, template configs you want, um, the ks.cfg, for example, doing um, what you need it to do during the boot and install process, these KS scripts files for disks, network management, password info for routes, um, that information is actually generated by the form that you're filling out in traffic portal. And then that ISO is basically built on the fly and streamed back to you with all the network identity information for a particular host baked in. Um, this makes it very easy to just go in, pop the you know virtual media attachment to that ISO, boot, and you're done. Now, in our case, um, we there's kind of some scaling issues with that. Um, when you're doing you know 10, 20, 100 hosts at a time, having to make individual ISOs for each system is both time consuming and error prone. It's very easy to accidentally um, attach the wrong ISO to the wrong uh, host, and then you end up with IP information out of whack. So um, the way we kind of did things is we stepped outside of the traffic control project itself um, and instead uh, formulated more of a generic kickstart um, that addresses uh, all systems without regard to its information. And then one of my colleagues last year at this time at ApacheCon 2019 gave a presentation on Daemon that he had created and open sourced called TC NetConfig. Um, you heard in the last talk with Sergey um, a little bit of alludement to this. So um, effectively what the Daemon does is that um, it just phones home to traffic ops and says, who am I? Tell me what my IP info should be. Tell me what my host name should be. And I'll go and apply that for you. Um, so that way we have one ISO that scales much greater than uh, where we were before. Now, the other downside to this is that it um, does rely on IPv6 autoconf router advertisements, um, which is not um, typically turned on by default in a lot of cases, but um, is supported. It's not the same thing as DHCP, but in the, co in the scope of how IPv6 works, it's very similar. Now, in my case, um, working on labs and lab environments, I have the kind of unique problem that um, since Traffic Ops uses itself as its own system of record, I have a chicken and egg problem of, well, I can't delegate to Traffic Ops to tell me what my network information is if Traffic Ops doesn't exist yet. So um, this is where I kind of got into the idea of thinking, well, maybe instead, I can uh, look at creating a third party, you know, out of band system to just hold the information long enough to get those initial systems off the ground and transfer the system of record responsibility off um, to traffic ops once it's ready. So um, the ISOs that I made are very, very similar to the ones we use for um, the normal production deployments with the universal ISO approach with the exception of instead of using the TC net config daemon, I simply leverage Ansible Jinja 2 templates to simply render um, if config and if route files appropriately. When it comes to physical um, deployments, um, it basic, there are lots and lots of tools to help you manage that, but it fundamentally at some point boils down to almost two approaches. Um, the most common by far is leveraging PXE um, which relies on DHCP um, and a couple of other technologies to effectively at boot time in the BIOS, tell it where to go look for an image to run. Now, in our case, um, you know, if you're running in a small network, um, you know, you have total control over it. That might be applicable to you and it might be easier um, to work with. Now, in our case, because our network is exceptionally large and complicated in a lot of ways, um, it's not as easy to ensure consistency on those configurations across the board. So instead, what we do here is um, we leverage the uh, Ansible playbooks um, and uh, modules that are either part of the core project or supplied by our hardware vendors to provide a, a rudimentary um, 
step of mount remote ISO image from share from file share somewhere, set a one-time boot and go. Um, so it's not leveraging PXE to manage um, those deployments. Um, it's out of band. And um, that way, we don't have to necessarily coordinate as tightly with our networking infrastructure teams. Now, when it comes to cloud, um, there are uh, lots of ways you can skin that cat. Um, but in our case, uh, we leverage HashiCorp Terraform as an abstraction layer uh, for our cloud infrastructure so that um, if today we're in AWS and tomorrow we want to be in Google Cloud Platform, it's not a complete rehash of, of all the infrastructure and tooling. Now, when it comes to DNS, we leverage the Vinyl DNS project um, as an API self-service wrapper around Bind so that that way um, we can adjust our DNS configs during deployment without having to work with our DNS teams either. For our compute stack, um, we use OpenStack resources managed by one of our internal teams. And then when it comes to specialization, we leverage CloudInit um, to get those systems from their base template state into more of the generalized um, state um, going forward. Speaking of steady state, um, we are a stateful system, so um, we don't quite hold on to the concepts of immutable infrastructure so much, um, but we do uh, deploy our systems and keep them alive until such times they need to be um, reborn for whatever reason, be it maintenance problems or regular routine upgrades. So that steady state is doing the basic things like making sure YUM repositories go to the right places, making sure user accounts are managed the right ways, firewalls, etc. Now, when it comes to managing steady state, um, if you've used Ansible before, um, the out of the box behavior that you're probably the most familiar with is the notion of having a control host. This is probably like your laptop, um, but it might be something more enterprisey like Ansible Tower, for example. And it's based on the premise that um, you define a pattern of hosts and it pushes those uh, set of tasks to those hosts to perform, which is fine. Um, that's one approach to doing it. It's very successful in a lot of infrastructures. In our case, however, we chose to go kind of the other way. There's another binary in standard installations of Ansible you'll find called Ansible pull. Instead of pushing commands to target patterns of hosts, instead, Ansible pull inverts the control flow. Instead saying, periodically, a cron job kicks off and says, go fetch any latest git commits um, from some git repository you've got configured and apply anything that might uh, need to be done. So each host has no concept of other hosts. It's only itself. And notably, Git in this case scales very well horizontally um, with load balancers, with different patterns of moving mirrors around, et cetera. There are lots of ways to make Git scale. Um, and notably, also, one of the other big benefits we had in this case was it allowed us to do things like uh, move changes to our steady state through standard Git workflow practices like GitFlow or GitHub flow to be able to modify um, infrastructure in rollout, um, you know, small rollouts at a time so that that way we can uh, ensure that changes that might go sideways only apply to either lower environments or smaller blast radiuses of production itself um, until we're more uh, certain of their success being assured. Coming back a little bit to the recap from last year, um, thinking a little bit more about um, those three layers of the stack, um, and it's not just enough to think of it so much in, in those uh, purely delineated sections. There are also contracts that need to be observed between those layers. Um, so for example, um, the provisioning layer is one of the most uh, easy to think about in this case, because the provisioning layer needs to be able to provide information to later on during the process as to what hosts are in scope. So if you're doing things like saying, give me three caches, for example, in a cloud infrastructure mixed with um, physical hosts in for traffic ops and traffic ops DB, for example, um, and all the other components of the stack, um, something has to assemble an Ansible compliant inventory that can um, be passed further along down the line so that as the steady state and application layers go to do their thing, they know what they're specifically targeting. Um, 
if you've got an out of band management kind of thing like I do for uh, physical infrastructure, that makes the physical side a little bit easier to pre compute up front. But in terms of cloud resources, you may not you may not know what the IPs or host names are until after they're created. So there's a feedback loop and a contract that has to exist there. Um, and it also might serve as some form of sentinel value to say, hey, the steady state layer is done, it's ready to move on. Let's go specialize some applications um, and get those running. When it comes to each one of those application component layer um, pieces, uh, the way I think about it is um, they all follow more or less a standard template of go load some variable data that's important um, for this deployment um, and specifically this environment, then wrap uh, a implementation specific driver playbook around a generic core Ansible role. That implementation specific driver could be things that are, you know, important to you and your implementations like, you know, your monitoring systems or um, your metrics or um, being able to tie in other system of record, et cetera, and your workflows. Um, the generic core, on the other hand, is the open source um, role that is in the traffic control repository today in the infrastructure um, repository, uh, in the infrastructure folder of the traffic control repository. Now, how do you get those roles into something that's usable, you know, when, at runtime? Um, there are lots of ways to handle versioning of roles. Um, Ansible Galaxy is one of the most common ones, um, but I chose to use a tool called GILT or Git Layering Technology. It's available on PyPy or PIP. Um, it's very simple to, to use. It's basically just a, a YAML config file that defines a set of repositories, a set of references inside of the repositories, be it branches, commits, tags, etc., cetera, um, and then files of you know, source and destination in the repository to your working directory, where do you want things to go? So effectively, it's just a really fancy wrapper around Git clone and copy. Kind of the last important concept to think about um, from, from before is the notion of variable precedence. Um, in Ansible, when you're interpolating variables, there's lots of places that can come from. There, in fact, there are 21 of them here. On the far end, you have the role defaults, um, which are in the open source, for example being at the lowest uh, precedence level overridden by anything from anywhere, all the way up to the most important things, which are things passed in on the command line at runtime. Now, at this point, um, I didn't originally consider it this way, um, but it occurred to me that because both Ansible and Terraform support supplying JSON-based variable files on the command line, I could take the process and the workflows for deploying environments to be more abstract, more uh, generalized. And so this is when I got kind of the light bulb moment of, you know what, maybe I can be a little bit more ambitious here and think about things in terms of self-service as opposed to um, having to custom roll every one of these things each time, even if it's only the small pieces um, for, the things around the generic cores that are different or nuanced. Um, but it allows me to be able to take all the pieces that make each individual environment special and instead um, bring them into that external system of record, which in my case, I call the lab manager. Um, the lab manager is a you know internal application for us because again, it wouldn't make a whole lot of sense to, to really kind of dig into the details of it so much. but. The important things here were that it resolved the chicken and egg problem with traffic ops. It was a reliable system of record with, which focused on data relationships, integrity, and more importantly, was simple. Um, I'll go over some of the concepts that are modeled inside of it so that um, you kind of have an idea as to how deep some of that rabbit hole goes um, and what my scope was. But first of all, you know, technology choices wise, you know, when I went to go build it, I wanted to pick up um, GraphQL uh, it's an up and coming alternative to REST mm -hmm. that solves several of the problems that one of my colleagues today earlier mentioned about REST with things like the N plus one problem um, when it comes to REST or primary keys. Um, and so GraphQL is originally developed by Facebook and graduated into its own foundation um, where there are now several implementations. On the other end, um, I wanted a relational database on the back end. Um, and 
the 800 pound gorilla in the room at that point is Postgres. And more importantly, uh, the traffic control project already leverages Postgres as it is. So the skill sets and tools needed to work with it, understand it, manipulate it, develop it, were already there and present on our team, myself included. Now, to kind of stitch together both ends of that spectrum, um, from protocol to back end, I leveraged an open source um, library called Postgrefile. Um, it's been around for a little while now, it's open source. Um, you can use it as a library or a standalone, but it's a, more importantly, effectively a no code to low code solution um, when it comes to getting functional APIs off the ground for basically nothing. Um, I went ahead and made it into a library so that I could add a few other libraries to it to make it uh, handle a couple of use cases I had that were different and to make it just a bit more user friendly getting off the ground. A little bit more details about how that particular library works um, and how it ties into the bigger picture of what I was trying to accomplish. Um, the most important thing here was security. Um, being able to make sure that the API was secure from the get-go um, to make sure that the data was protected and that it was, more importantly, not a hassle to have to deal with. So uh, I leverage an OAuth2 provider to get a valid JWT back, which um, is then in turn validated and passed along through Postgre file all the way down into Postgres itself. And once it's in Postgres itself, you can leverage the native Postgres permission schemes that are available inside the database as is. So you can do things like row, uh, row column or table permissions. And um, because the JWT data is exposed inside of the database as variable um, in the context of the query, you can also do check constraints to ensure things like um, applying ownership or change tracking to user IDs. Notably, this also allows me to leverage things like the concept of a role in an, inside the JWT or claims or uh, permissions or capabilities, um, otherwise conceptually, to be able to control what people see, can, and do um, with said API. So um, as a side benefit there, because I don't have to, um, the, the username, for example, is simply a piece of ancillary data. So I don't actually need to, in Postgres, define individual users as a concept. I can only, I, I can, for example, use the role in the Postgres sense being a collection of users with a set of permissions instead. Business logic-wise, out of the box, you get CRUD, um, create, read, update, destroy. You get specific functions for every table out of the box um, that you have. And that includes if you do all the proper data modeling and documentation inside the database, it's propagated upward into the GraphQL schema as well. Now, this is an example of a mutation doing a creative on a division object, which is one of the most basic concepts in the traffic control data model, which is simply just a string, which has a one to many relationship, or actually really zero to many relationship with regions, which is again, just another string. Now, in this case, this is one operation to simply ensure that the division record exists. Postgrefile also does um, read at runtime anything that um, is a Postgres function or stored procedure and then interprets those immediately into new uh, mutation functions or query functions, which also extends to views as well, be it um, materialized or not so that you can implement your own custom business logic as well. So you can define a function that takes certain parameters and does as many things as you like. So in this case, I'm not only passing in the name of the division, but also regions I want associated to it in a single transaction. If you're interested in learning a little bit more about that, um, there's actually an experimental setup um, already committed to the traffic control repository in our experimental stuff. That's enough to kind of get you a basic environment up and off the ground. Uh, moving on to kind of the data concepts of the data uh, of the lab manager, uh, the environment is probably the most fundamental and key piece of information, right? Um, there's basic metadata um, that you want to hold on to, but if you've ever really tried to build an Apache traffic control CDN before, you already know there's 10 gajillion knobs in the system that can be tuned all manner of ways. Um, so 
one of the things that I did here was um, instead of trying to create a hard schema of here is the totality of all options present in the system, I instead simply leverage a JSON column of the database, which is then presented all the way through as raw unstructured JSON in GraphQL to be able to model um, all the various and sundry configuration items um, without having to necessarily enumerate them. Because simply if I tried to enumerate them, it'd be out of date by the time I got finished. Um, there's a little bit of a loose schema that I did apply, and I'll come back to why I did that um, closer to the end. Um, but effectively, um, it's unstructured, but there is a, a loose structure at the very root of the dictionary. The guilt config um, also is a, considered a field of the environment itself. Um, you saw earlier that it's a YAML file. Well, Postgres doesn't have YAML as a concept built in, but it does JSON again. So um, Ansible has a very easy, easy, easy conversion process of JSON down to YAML. So um, effectively, I just jam that uh, guilt config into the definition of the environment as JSON, which then gets rendered at runtime down to the YAML file that's being expected. This allows each environment to be able to find um, different points from whence its code comes. So if, for example, I want to grab um, the latest and greatest versions of the code available, I can grab it off the head of master. Um, if I'm doing some scary development work on one particular area, I can grab one of the generic cores or a piece of my um, code from somewhere else in a totally different repository, be it internal or external, um, and weave that in at runtime. The next concept, which is probably the most variatic, is the notion of a resource pool, whether it's physical or virtual. In the case of virtual, it probably looks a little bit like an asset management system sort of thing, but not really. Um, and then on the cloud side of things, you're basically doing a, tra a quota around your tracking of your quotas and the, whatever your cloud resources are. Um, when it comes to physical infrastructure, you do have to provide some other um, ancillary data when it comes to actually associating those physical assets with the CDN, namely, which environment do you want to tag those resources to? What thing is it going to be at the end of the day, whether it's a cache or whether it's a database, whether it's an API server, et cetera? And then uh, what CDN does it belong to? Since a given uh, Apache Traffic Control instance can have multiple CDNs rep, uh, represented, um, if you're building a cache, you need to be able to specify to which CDN that belongs. Next concept here is a job. So uh, I didn't want the lab manager to just be a you know, read, write, CRUD database. I want it to be more of a life cycle tool for an environment. So, um, the notion of a job was effectively something I want a backend process to do for me. So doing things like saying, um, let me file a job query that does things like, um, you know, build an environment from scratch or destroy it back to nothing and release the resources or expand it or upgrade it. Those operations are nebulous and can be defined esoterically as you just, as you see fit. But the notion of a job to being able to define a life cycle events um, of an environment. The next big one here was logs. Um, there are many, many ways to slice and dice that uh, into different ways. Um, a little bit of implementation detail here. Uh, when it comes to actually running the playbooks themselves, I leverage the JUnit um, output callback plugin to be able to export all the log data as a flat file in XML format conformant to the JUnit format, which is then picked up and um, processed um, actually within Postgres itself because Postgres supports native operations on XML as well as JSON. So um, that way I can break apart and re, uh, reconfigure the data as I see fit to en uh, enrich it to be more useful. Next, um, I went ahead and threw in the concept of a fact inventory. Um, if you're used to the concept of PuppetDB or um, Ansible Tower, I believe, has a very similar concept of just being able to say, I know all the facts about all the things um, inside of my domain. So Ansible generates fact data on every run um, by default, unless you tell it not to, that includes um, a lot of information about the system. And notably, because 
the variable, the data is going to vary from implementation to implementation. Um, it's not, I couldn't structure it per se. This is again where using a native unstructured JSON column mixed with um, a Postgres view to be able to use native JSON operators to then expose common pieces um, through the API of GraphQL. Now let me move on to the next big piece here, um, the other half of the system, which is the lab executor. We talked about the lab manager that basically is just the system of record. This is the piece that actually does work. So when it comes to the abstractions of how all this works, I could spend forever on kind of digging into details, but at a high level, um, I chose to use a Docker container to help insulate the dependencies that it might have, as well as improve portability. Notably, there are still some gotchas that hide between running Docker on OS X versus on Linux um, when it comes to things like IPv6 and um, SSH key access pass-throughs. So it's not perfect, but it's a lot better than it could be. Um, then I have the notion of a root shell script as well, which is the, the lowest of levels of execution um, at runtime. This is where uh, the, the most primitive things happen, like being able to upload logs at the very, very end and flag the job state of either you did something successfully or it failed in some way. Um, and the reason I went with shell here is simply because it was a lot easier to redirect shell output to itself um, so that even this lowest level script has access to its own output to then upload as a log. Uh, a little bit inceptionist, but um, it, it, it really does help when you're uh, triaging those lowest of levels. Then the notion of an executor playbook, it could have been blended into the shell script, but um, I wanted to use the technology and skill sets um, that would make it easier to maintain over the long haul. So this is where things like the code weaving and obtaining of work happens. And then um, also um, beyond that point is the job entry point playbook, uh, which is effectively and conceptually like what you could think of as main um, in a normal application execution. Um, I use these uh, a convention on the naming of those to leverage both the type of environment and the operation being performed on the environment to formulate the name of the playbook that's being executed. That way, um, the playbooks defining those variances can actually coexist happily in the same repository um, and not cross interfere with one another. When it comes to execution logging and security, um, security obviously is an important concept. So uh, First of all, when it comes to security, I expect all the developers working in the system, uh, I mean, not just using it, but actually developing in it to appropriately make use of the no log option on any Ansible module that might emit sensitive information so that it doesn't end up in the logs. Additionally, because I assume humans are humans um, and are fallible, Therefore, um, there's, also, there's also a backup mechanism that's part of the executor. Now, earlier I mentioned I use um, the JUnit output being XML. One of the things I did here was to actually write a small XSLT to process those files before upload to do some basic token-based um, pattern matching and redact um, fields as necessary um, because assuming humans make mistakes and overlook things, um, just as a backup mechanism to try and prevent that from happening. When it comes to tips and tricks about Ansible itself to make it go faster, do the job better, um, one of the things that um, you can do is parallelize. So there's a couple of ways you can do this. So with um, parallelization, you can do um, kind of like a pause on an individual task while you operate over a long um, dictionary of objects or list of objects. Um, and then also you can do kind of a fire and forget model where you don't care about the answers. You just say, you know, go off in the background and do what you want to do. Um, and again, um, the concept of forks is an important low level concept in Ansible that basically defines how many independent Python um, interpreters are allowed to spin up at a given moment. Um, and then the last parallelization pattern here is fire and revisit. So it looks, it starts like the fire and forget pattern, except that it registers a handle, which at a later point of execution in a separate task can then be um, blocked on and waited until it's complete. Now, this is a really important um, thing for us um, when deploying CDNs in CDN environments, because it means that 
for the various components of the ATC stack that have no dependencies of among each other, we can actually start those asynchronous deploys of all the components at the same time, and then simply wait for all of them to have completed before moving on to the next tier of components that have obviously dependencies on lower level tiers. Um, so like you have to deploy uh, Postgres for TODB before you can deploy traffic ops, for example. Um, there is a gotcha here um, I'll also mention, which is that um, the async options are not available on every Ansible module, notably not the include or import based modules. So um, I mentioned earlier that I think of those, uh, the implementation, uh, the there's a drive implementation specific driver playbook for each component. Well, that comes into play here. Um, instead of um, having one playbook that simply invokes or includes other playbooks into its own main thread, I leverage the shell module, um, which does allow the async option to actually create separate Ansible playbook invocations as separate proxies, um, doing those individual component installs. Um, that way, um, there's no cross pollution of uh, data. That's on, only what's available um, from the variable files being defined is what shows up at runtime. And then kind of lastly here um, for tips and tricks, one of the fun things that I had to wrestle with at some point, um, maybe I could have done it differently or better in different ways, but I came up with the concept of meta templating. Now, when it comes to CDN configuration, I told you earlier that um, it's an unstructured, mostly JSON blob. Well, that's true except that the root keys in that case are what I basically define to be separate files to be used at separate times in the deployment. Now, uh, it turns out that not just the complexity of the application or the complexity of the code modeling the application, um, it's the, one of the harder questions you have to answer in deployments is not just what to do, but when do you have the data available to know what to do? So for example, if you want to say, what's the TO URL for this environment? Um, if you're leveraging cloud resources, you don't know the host names to tell it in a hard coded way, for example. So you need to leverage the inventory to tell you that. But the inventory when it starts doesn't actually have that information because it hasn't been provisioned yet. So um, by being able to take these, um, the the template module has one of the lesser known options to it that was more recently added to allow you to override what Ansible treats, and more importantly, Jinja underneath it, treats as the variable interpolation token. The way that um, I leverage that is by saying, you know what, I can co-mingle co in the same object um, things with different interpolation tokens so that they're rendered at separate times. So I can render things in this case um, for the provisioning layer up front make it available up front, but maybe I have other pieces of data that are only available later in the process. So again, in the same config object, I can still model it, but I use the template module to simply render the J2 template, which is itself as a J2 template rather, which then generates a Ansible variable file to then be included further down the road. Um, it's a modestly complicated system to wrap your head around, but um, it actually works pretty well. Now, when it comes to future work, um, things that are coming down the pipe, um, the main bulk of the work is already in the main line of the Apache Traffic Control Repository. You can use it today with GILT um, if you so choose. Um, but also, um, I do have my own fork where I've been doing a bunch of refactor work and also more um, of my day-to-day uh, -day kind of things so far. So there are more improvements coming. Um, again, because of guilt, you can leverage it today if you really want to, but I make no promises that it's perfectly stable yet. Um, so kind of takeaways here, you know, um, I'm hoping you've got a better feel for how the open source and closed source pieces um, in your implementations might work together, how uh, your technology stack can make a difference in how you implement your solutions, how complex the end-to-end -end picture actually is, and more importantly, how you how you might go about tackling um, getting yourselves into these better positions. Now, my contact info is here. I know I don't have a ton of time. We'll go until the session kicks us off, um, but uh, you're welcome to reach me out on the Traffic Control CDN uh, Slack instance.
Um, I'm pretty easy to find with the ATC Robots channel. Um, so, uh, Dave, how much question? How many questions do we have here? Yeah, thanks, Jonathan. Um, looks like we just have one. Uh, concept of a job is great. Provides state tracking for longer running tasks. Now, when a job fails, can it be restarted so it continues from where it failed? That's a good question. Um, my solution doesn't um, because the, uh, there's a lot of state questions that come into play there. Um, because, because of the asynchronous nature of deployments, it gets kind of funny when um, you have one thing fail and you don't necessarily know what happened to the rest of them. Um, and also recovery is one of the most complicated pieces you could probably come up with. So I kind of uh, skirted that and simply um, for things that I know are problematic, I leverage the retry option uh, built into Ansible on particular tasks that are error prone. Um, but if for some reason there's a legitimate failure of some kind, um, like not having enough quota or a typo in the code somewhere, um, and it fails, um, I can review the log data to know where it failed um, and uh, hopefully have an idea as to how to remediate it going forward. Um, so to answer your question, no, I don't really track the state per se within the execution for resumption. Instead, I track the state in the sense of binary yes or no um, to an end user. Was it good or was it not good? Um, and then if it's not good, figure out why, and then simply hit it with a big hammer and redeploy it from scratch all over again, um, because it's a whole lot easier to use a big hammer in those sense than to try to triage all the ways that it might have gone sideways. Cool, thanks. Um, the, uh, got it. Can the current set of Ansible automation be used to bring up a CDN from scratch? So the, the, that was where I started. Um, the CD in a box effort can, but it's gonna be limited to local resources. The Ansible-based yeah. approach um, is not an out-of-the-box solution. Um, you do have to uh, implement your own pieces around it because, again, the scope of the ATC project effectively limits the uh, scope of the generic cores to being around the application layers. I mean. Just because I use OpenStack doesn't mean you do. So it wouldn't exactly be appropriate for me to say, you know what, hey, you got to use OpenStack for this to work. Um, and obviously, when it gets into infrastructure details, there are all manner of different problems that will span from implementation to implementation. Um, so it, you know, conventionally, you know, people are around to kind of maybe give you some tips, but there's not going to be an out of the box, hey, you just go rip this out and uh, you're off and running in a day. Um, in production. You do have to kind of do some legwork to make it fit in your infrastructure. Yep, and if you're interested in that, like Jonathan already said, the, uh, the channel on the Slack is a good place to discuss. Yep. Cool. Um, all right. Well, thanks again, Jonathan. That's really good. Um, and thanks to everyone um, for, for everything all day long. Um, but I think we are done. Great. Thanks, everybody. Have a good rest of your day. Thanks. Have a fun ApacheCon. <laughs> yeah, you too. <laughs> See ya.